Okay, I guess we're up. Um, I want to talk through how uh, governments are, you know, across Australia are actually using social media today because we hear a lot about what government departments should do or what they could do or what they will do, but the actual fact is there's, an, there's a whole lot of activity going on now and some very good uh, examples of, of good use of social media um, and, and Gov 2.0, which is what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to flick sides a little bit, so excuse me for leaning over so every now and then. Um, just for the people in the room who don't know me, um, I, uh, I, I've spent about uh, 15 years in sort of the, the internet online industries. I've spent five years working in government. I only recently stepped out to work for uh, back in the private sector for a company called Delib. Um, but um, so I have a I have an understanding of what people in government go through um, because I did a lot of the same kind of work, um, and I also saw a lot of good examples um, as well as some not so good examples while I was in there of different types of initiatives in this space. Um, I do blog at a, at a place called eGovAU, and I'm a fairly prolific Twitterer. Um, so you'll see me talking about GovHack today, uh, Gov uh, Camp today, and you can you know find various things out from my blog. Uh, I thought I should start by firstly saying that what we are actually seeing right now through something that's called Gov 2.0 is a fundamental change in how uh, governments interact with their citizens. And I think it's, it's important to really you know, consider that where you start out from because we've gone very much from having a, a sort of government which um, worked in the paper age that, that engaged people in very controlled and very managed circumstances to being an environment which is really out outside of government's control, where people can get online, they can set up their own websites, they can say what they want, they can get that out to quite large audiences. So government is no longer simply you know, engaging with the media to manage and control messages, but it's also engaging with individuals, organisations, basically anyone with an internet account. So it is a really fundamental change in the entire sort of environment we're operating in. Um, and when I talk about Gov 2.0, social media forms part of it, but it is larger than that. Uh, it really, I, I, I sort of sum it up by saying that it's really about um, the new tools and techniques that are sort of enabled by all the new media and, and digital media technologies that allow government to work more closely with citizens, that bring citizens within in the tent. Um, it also encompasses all, all the open data side of things, where government is opening up a lot more data for public to, uh, to view, to interact with and to create new applications and tools with. And we just recently finished um, GovHack, which was, I think it was a very successful event, where um, around 140 developers uh, produced about 42 uh, applications in a 48-hour period using government data. Um, and that sort of creativity and innovation is something that, that is, is really good to foster and it can lead into some very good ongoing sort of uh, outcomes for government. Um, finally, Gov2 know is not all about government. Um, a lot of innovation is happening out there across the rest of the world uh, and things are happening that are impacting on government whether or not government likes it. So it's very important to reflect on the fact that there's things like the Sunlight Foundation over in, in the States, there's um, the, the Hansard Society over in the UK, there's Open Australia here and there's individuals and groups who are producing things which can impact on what government does without government really being in the controlling chair anymore. Um, and particularly in Australia, we live in a very high connected society. Uh, I know people do still talk about disadvantaged groups and people who don't have as much access, but if you actually look at the figures that have come out, and there are some new figures out due very, very shortly, uh, we're talking about 95-odd you know, percent of the population who are connected to the internet. So we are working with, with citizens who do use these technologies. That doesn't mean they're necessarily proficient, they're highly proficient with them because we're all on learning journeys, but they are using them. So it, it's not as though you know you have situations say in Indonesia where only about 25% of citizens or households are online. We actually have very, very high penetration rate, particularly when you look at people at the age of 30 or younger. 
We're also very high users of social media. Uh, we have a position where you know two thirds of Australians online, which is effectively two thirds of the adult population of Australia, uh, report themselves as using social media. And I think that even understates it because that doesn't count necessarily people who watch a couple of YouTube videos, maybe embedded in a news report, or who comment at the end of articles. Those people are also participating in social media that may not see themselves as doing so. So we also have a population that's that's not only highly um, you know interacting or well, not highly online and actually using the internet but it's in interacting online at a very significant stage so that pro provides a lot of opportunities for government to actually take advantage of that to actually engage people it also of course provides risks and challenges for government what do you do if a group of citizens gets together to push a particular point and how do you actually manage that through an agency's normal systems um, and uh, just to point out which social media channels we use, I know we've had a good discussion just earlier through Damien about how there's, social media is not all Facebook and Twitter, but in Australia the dominant two channels that people identify as being used as social media are really Facebook and well, LinkedIn and then Twitter are the two main interactive ones. YouTube is also up there quite a bit, but that's more for uploading and viewing videos, so it's not quite as interactive. But there are so LinkedIn is 16 Twitter is 14 I didn't get those stats yet so there you go so they've both grown um, which is a really good sign thanks for that John so what about governments um, I've been doing something which is struck a bit of controversy in a few corners, which is basically I put out an FOI request to 166 government agencies, basically asked them about the social media channels that they used publicly. Part of the reason I did that was in five years working in government, I could never find out across government who was using which channels. Uh, and I do keep you know records of as much as I possibly can, but actually knowing who is using what channels, to me, inside government, was immensely useful to know, to look at you know people who are doing it well, and who was not doing it so well, uh, and also knowing who to, you know, to liaise with and work with in order to get messages out more for, uh, further. And I always found it a struggle to find out that information. So one of the things I did was I put out an FOI request to try and get that information, um, gradually trying to release that information out publicly, <coughs> but there's obviously a lot of work in putting it together. But what I've found so far from that, of, of the responses I've received, I was getting a rate of about 73% of government agencies are using social media media for their official business. Now, I think that's a, a, a really good sign. Um, I know people talk about government being backwards and behind the times and, you know, not in tune with what's going on. But I think if you actually look at it into a detailed sense and you're looking at the different programs and communications campaigns and the ways, you know, government is engaging with stakeholders, we are actually, the majority of government agencies at, at a federal level today are using social media in their official communications. Um, and the ones who aren't are probably not that far away from using it in many cases as well. There's probably a few who will, you know, stay away from those areas because it never suits their tools. But, you know, even when you think about it, even if you're just listening through these channels, there's purposes for using social media because it gives you a view on what's going on outside your organisation. It gives you a view on uh, how other professionals in your fields are using, you know, are, are, what they're learning and what they're working on. So it really does give you a really good way to actually gain that wider intelligence that's harder to get through other channels today. So what are they actually using it for? Now, something, it was a little bit interesting to me, but the number one thing that they said they were using it for, and note that agencies gave multiple responses. On average, there were three to four different things that agencies said they, would, they were using it for. Um, but the number one thing was actually stakeholder engagement. So it's how they're actually, you know, they've got some sort of group set up or some sort of way of basically interacting with, with the, the, the key stakeholders they have to engage with on a regular basis using social media. Uh, working down from there, um, it's operating campaigns, it's responding to customer inquiries, and it goes on to engaging with journalists and engaging with other government departments, which I think is an area which will also grow. So, if you're actually, if you're a government agency today and you're not using these channels, you are in the minority. 
and the way people are using them, government agencies are using it, are in ways that make sense, that actually deliver value, better outcomes to agencies. So I think it's, uh, it's a really good sign of what's going on. Um, and I think also across all levels of government, we've seen enormous adoption of social media. Um, so this is uh, what I've been tracking uh, over the last five or six years. I've been trying to track the different types of things people have been using. Again, my numbers aren't precise because it gets very hard. I get to a point and then I say, I know there's more out there, but I haven't found them yet. So, but we're seeing you know, massive adoption of Twitter, quite a lot of use of blogs and Facebook, often for similar purposes. Um, there's a lot of mobile apps. A lot have come out at state level in particular. Um, and it's actually surprising when you think, you know, there's 80 odd mobile apps across government agencies. That's an awful lot of expertise in building mobile apps and how they work that can be shared across government to actually help people who are looking at this medium. So, a lot going on. Um, and a, a way I guess I track this is by looking at the Twitter account. So I actually updated this today. So this is the, the latest figures as of um, essentially a, a day ago. Um, so we're looking at, at around 460 uh, Twitter accounts. That's the growth curve over time. Um, to look at that in a bit more of a breakdown, if you look at it, about uh, a quarter of them are federal, um, and about you know 44% of them are state-based. So state is you know the sweet spot. There's obviously a lot of agencies there, but local government is also very very big. Um, and it, and it still astounds me today that you know the first Twitter account that was set up by government in Australia that I can find um, back in uh, November 2007 was actually by a regional New South Wales council, Narromine, um, and they're still tweeting and using that channel very effectively today. So it's not just a thing just for large government departments, it's not just a thing just for metro centres. It is something that has a lot of utility, but a lot of it is you have to find the utility and develop the utility yourself over time. Um, and uh, by jurisdiction, you know, obviously New South Wales and Victoria are leaders, but you know, every single territory and state is represented in using these channels. So. I'm actually just about out of time, so I'm just going to run through these slides very quickly, a couple of seconds each. So there's some new roles that we're seeing government actually adopting um, due to social media. The first one is that government is becoming a media provider in its own right. It's no longer reliant on the distribution networks of big media owners. Um, the Queensland Police Service Facebook page, for example, has over 286,000 followers. Um, the circulation of the Courier Mail on a week, on a, on a Monday to Friday basis is about 188,000. So it's the, who's the largest media provider in Queensland? There's an argument to be made that it's actually Queensland Police Services. Um, government is also becoming much more a convener of communities than a controller of communities, where it's basically setting up platforms where it's bringing people together to actually discuss challenges or uh, things that the government's trying to achieve and doing it in a much more collaborative and consultative way than has been possible before. So there's examples across Australia. There's actually a very good example from a, from a city in WA who actually won an international award for what they were doing. And this is growing and growing over time. Um, a lot of it is simply about, you know, things flow through the permission cycle and finally these things go on. Um, and thirdly, we're seeing a lot of government as platform where essentially government is making information available and letting people take that and use it in their own way. So data.gov is obviously a very big factor in that and, and GovHack was uh, a very big event that came out of it just recently. Um, but we're also seeing this, you know, in, in different forms as well. Um, particularly with ABARES, they've released a lot of agricultural information over 100 years and they also provide tools to analyse it as well. Um, so finally, last slide last 30 seconds. Um, crowdsourcing is also growing in government. This is possibly the area where government in Australia has sort of lagged further behind what they've done in some other territories. Um, we focus more on that open data and on that, um, on, on, on sort of the, the, the communications and stakeholder engagement side. Crowdsourcing is, I think, going to come through gradual, more gradually. But we're starting to see uh, initiatives, and some of them have been running for some years, where government is actually using the, 
the collective knowledge or, um, I suppose, time of citizens to actually produce things of value. So a good example is through the National Library, who's been uh, crowdsourcing error corrections to its uh, newspaper, digitalised newspaper archive for a number of years now, and they've had millions of lines corrected. So that's basically it. I guess the caveats with all of this is that firstly, you know, social media, Gov 2.0, it doesn't replace the things government already does. It basically adds to them and enhances and amplifies what we already do. Um, so it's important that you don't necessarily stop everything else and adopt this wholesale. Um, it's about, you know, using them in together. Um, it doesn't work for all audiences and issues. There is some judgment involved in that process. Um, and finally, you know, n these things are only tools. They're, they're, they're new tools in the toolkit for government, but at the end of the day, they don't actually solve problems. People solve problems. So it's important to use them, but also know their limitations and know when it's the right time to bring things back in-house and actually solve the problems in the way that makes most sense. So thank you very much. Excellent. Can everybody just thank Craig, please? <laughs>